few months ago, I stumbled upon a podcast about the responsibilities and perceptions around being an artist. It talked about how often people categorize themselves as a creative or non-creative type of person. If you're an artist yourself, or maybe just a keen social observer, you'll notice that people's opinions can be very polarizing. They might quickly and strictly dismiss themselves from all art because they feel like they can't draw well. Or maybe they enjoy something like finance and feel like there's an inexplicable binary where an inclination towards Excel sheets might mean an abandonment of a painter's canvas. Either way, I kept listening. Creativity, more than anything, is a person's ability to make connections between things that wouldn't normally be associated with each other. It's that unassuming context or categorization that makes something really special. The technical aspects, painting well, figure drawing, filming steadily, all these things can be trained, but connections and the content are impactful. It was funny seeing Ollie Moss as one of the designers on the team for Firewatch because a sizable portion of his most visible work is an exercise of just that. Obscure connections. References that don't resolve in conclusion as much as relationship. And you find a lot of that going on in the Firewatch universe, environmentally and narratively. And my greatest joy in playing has been seeing the echo of this footprint in characters, stray documents you find in this universe, relationships, and so much more. think about it, the concept of a genre is more functionally sound as a marketing tool than a creative one. If you can think back to the birth of the mumblecore genre in film just a few years ago, a team of 20-somethings didn't come together and say, let's make a mumblecore film. Uh, they made something true to themselves, and the name accidentally came after by someone completely outside of it. Susan Buis, the director of Four-Eyed Monsters, which is essentially the first mumblecore film ever, explains it like this. But honestly, with like Mumblecore, I think the reason Furniture. that we've all been reticent to coin the term yeah. is because we don't want anyone saying it's a genre and then people getting interested in making films in that genre. Because yeah. we all made well, I think films. that's already happened. Right, but yeah, we but all made those films because we though. were like, we were excited to make them. And I think all of us would hope that other young filmmakers would make something that they're passionate about, not something that they fit would fulfill a genre. This is how I... I honestly want to call my experience a categorical because finishing Firewatch mirrored none of my experiences playing, watching, reading, or listening to anything else. If a gun were put to my head, I'd say that Firewatch is somewhere at the intersection of Walden, Her, Lisa Genova, Still Alice, and the third act of Spanglish. And even in this incredibly weird array, it's going to be something completely different to someone else because in Firewatch, the power of choice is often more pervasive than the choice itself. There is no good or bad ending. There's simply your ending. And sometimes different choices yield the same outcomes, but it's more important that you were given the choice to own nonetheless. I'm pretty excited to be in a moment of interactive titles where narrative can be as deconstructive as Firewatch's is. And that's really what it is. Firewatch is incredibly deconstructive, which makes it one of the most memorable titles I've played this year. Firewatch begins with a text-oriented love story. You're Henry. You meet a girl named Julia. Henry and Julia have a likable modern romance filled with honesty, self-awareness, and a grace for each other's shortcomings. The last text-based choose-your-own-adventure short story I played was a fan translation of Radical Dreamers, so this was definitely a fresh beginning to a title for me. I enjoyed it. It presented the kind of personable dialogue that Lifeline received much attention for. This prologue easily carries the relational gravitas of Pixar's Up for those who aren't put off by the idea of an interactive story. Through a series of events, both fortunate and otherwise, you find yourself stepping away from Julia and taking a job as a firewatch at a national park. You might consider it the equivalent of checking yourself into an insane asylum. Call it a final cry for much needed solitude. This job has you glued to a walkie-talkie with a woman on the other line. Her name is Delilah. She's your boss. She's happy to help. You two will likely get close, but you're married. Your call. Regardless of where you stand, you get to know each other, yourself, and the wilderness that you're staying in. There's some guy out here giving me the creeps. The creeps? 
Henry, there's... there's something I... Something someone should have told you about this area. What is it? It's... outside. The whole thing. And people come and go as they please. It's... it's... it's madness. John Vanneman, Jake Rodkin, Chris Remo, and Patrick Ewing put a tremendous effort into channeling their writing backgrounds towards something believable. The narrative pacing and dialogue was so successfully engaging that it's kind of no wonder why I found myself wanting an option to initiate conversation with Delilah during the longer stretches of walks. The emotive performance Sissy Jones and Rich Summer put on for this one is also quite transformative, considering these are the voices that stay with you the whole way. It's amazing how dynamic it is over those four hours. Because Mr. Stash still stands as one of my favorite short films, I was familiar with Summer's work, alongside his role in The Giant Mechanical Man. Jones was a first, however, though she has a paper trail with Telltale worth noting. In my head at least, designing a largely free roam game built around a forest sounds like a design nightmare. Encouraging exploration demands a vastness of some kind. I'm not as curious on a straight dirt road as I am on a forked path. Firewatch had amazing detours and enclaves, and the challenge I see in taking that on for anything is a wise distribution of landmarks, boundaries, and pathways. How do we make things feel huge, but familiar within reasonable time so that half of travel is in constant cursor checking the map? Remember Vanilla WoW? Yeah, I'm not so into doing that with such a tight narrative. Firewatch is so not confusing and is so navigationally sound on that front. The game, for me, was about four hours, so that challenge of teaching a lot really early on seems incredibly great, yet somehow I'm dropped in this world that feels like I'm slowly placing down puzzle pieces on a spiraling path until I make my first geographic connection, and then my next. This area feels like it's mine by Act 2. The, the programming efforts by Ben Burbank, Patrick Ewing, Nels Anderson, Will Armstrong, and Paolo Sericcio that went into keeping this playground both bountiful and bounded where it needs to be did not go unnoticed. And mind you, Delilah is curiously sending me on missions that require me to scale the map east and west, north and south, just enough to get familiar and take note of where just might open up next. I mean, that's foreshadowing and conveyance, right? Experientially, there are so many implemented opportunities for discovery, and somehow the team was able to balance that with a lightly beaten path for those who take a greater interest in the mainline objectives. There's a disposable camera, letters, the most vibrant swatches I've seen in a landscape. Jin Ng and Ali Moss facilitated a fully realized and vivid environment that visually begs to be explored both in a 3D and 2D context respectively. And I can totally see how the enchanting design animation chops James Benson brings to the table from titles like Ori and the Blind Forest and I'm sure others, uh, I see how they really play out in this world. The power of light and shadow is exemplified here. The, the blurred lines of cell shades and photorealism are the first of their kind here for me. From a UX UI perspective, the affection was most certainly in the details. The hideable compass in hand was a great navigational solution. Uh, love that that was both in there, an option, and also just within the plane of gameplay rather than just another rectangle. Some titles like The Division, for example, have so much statistical complexity that they demand tons of overlays and it makes sense. But in a title like this, it's rad to see that the little information that is needed comparatively is tucked away and contextualized. Rodkin's creative direction all around banded together diverse creative solutions into something very comprehensive. An essential component to this whole environment was the music, as much as it was also the timing of the music. When I first saw the visual stills for Firewatch, I had a hunch that the music might fall into the vein of a lot of folk revival I had been hearing at the time. Somewhere in between the Civil Wars, Dave Van Ronk, and like Bon Iver. It's kind of really none of those actually, and I love it. Not that I hate folk, but thematically, this music taps into a bit of a western cinematic vernacular that supports the more suspenseful and anxiety-inducing moments alongside the moments of solitude. The steely leads on tracks like North Backcountry or the twang and stay in your tower and watch are thematic milestones for the whole thing. The creative addition of some Rhodes keys and tracks like Camp Approach add so much rounded color to the treble-centric lead guitar picking and I just find it so cool. These mysterious Rhodes tones especially come out in Canyon Sunset. I can't pinpoint a particular era or specific musician, and honestly that could just be because I don't know enough, uh, but I'd love to know where the inspiration for the soundtrack came from. 
Chris, this thing is made of magic. I, I seriously feel like a kid because it's so special and new. So there are no spoilers here, so you don't have to worry. But for the people running the online threads and message boards saying that the ending of Firewatch was crap, or that other word we use for crap, that kind of vocabulary really just, it doesn't apply here. The thing about this title, one of the paramount defining points is that the ending is yours. It's, it's like saying that Chrono Cross's 50 possible endings are crap, which is such an old school reference. We're at a place in narrative density here where scrutinizing the ending of something requires much more foresight. Let's respond to this technically and philosophically. Technically, Henry's capacity is bound to the player. Example, if you don't want to switch walkie-talkies, you actually don't have to. If you don't know what I'm talking about, pay it no mind, I didn't ruin anything, just don't think about it. In summary, Henry is no wiser than you are. At least this is the impression that I've gotten from every decision I've been able to make as him. Thus, Henry cannot jump to a conclusion that you did not facilitate in past decisions, and the world can't react to Henry in a way that wasn't facilitated in past decisions, specifically in the ending. Philosophically, if you approach Firewatch from a hyper nihilist lens, you might not enjoy the ending, but it becomes very clear that it helps no one to negate the progress made up to that point. Firewatch, Gone Home, and That Dragon Cancer are right now the trifecta of titles that place their greatest ask in the conversations had after the game is done. They thrive on the viscerally gray within the world and outside of it. And that's what makes them so beautiful. You kind of want to play for the first time again, and it really is a shame that you can't. So what's the point of this essay? Why bother sharing these thoughts in such a public place? To be honest, the best part about enjoying Firewatch is that I can't entirely explain why. It's so enjoyable to not only play and replay, but to look back on fondly, or to make coffee to the soundtrack, or to speculate on Delilah's motives with the contentedness over never truly figuring them out. Firewatch is an honest walk through the complexities of responsibilities, romance, modern individualism, and curiosity. You're lured into love with someone who you can never fully trust, and there's a lingering second guess to every step of this ladder. I think it was Johnny Ive who said that we're capable of discerning more than we can articulate. And that's where I come from in saying that Firewatch is clearly more than the sum of its parts. I wouldn't dare attempt to contain it all in this exposition. I'd much rather do this highlight the strongest parts that I discovered in my journey through it, and the ones that are yet to be discovered. Thanks so much for listening, guys. Stay copacetic. I'm headed off to our Shoshone Where the birds and the bees won't know me Man and war won't exist no more And there ain't no gals to keep no score I'm taking off for the world